We're delighted to speak today with Dr. Ronnie Bannock, a healthcare entrepreneur, functional medicine doctor, and the founder of Envision Healthy New York City. Dr. Bannock is an expert in all things eyes, combining principles of traditional, complementary, and alternative medicine to treat and manage conditions, ranging from dry eye all the way to macular degeneration and even multiple sclerosis. Today, we will learn about her unique approach, including how to optimize nutrition for, the eye, for eye health and brain health, and what we need to know about digital blue light exposure, something that's especially important as we're all behind more and more screens. Thank you, Dr. Ronnie, for being here with us today on The Brain Possible. Um, so the context for this episode is to hear from you about your holistic approach um, to treating eye conditions, including a deep dive into what um, we need to know about the blue light exposure in this di digital age. And I know we've talked a, a bit about that on our blog. Um, as I've been learning about it and my own healthcare coaches have told me, you know, settings to change on my computer and to wear the little blue light blockers. But I was really excited to get to talk to you so that I could learn um, really more about why we need to do that. Um, mm -hmm. What's the purpose? Absolutely. Yeah, we can definitely do a deep dive into that. I know that there's a lot of confusion out there. So um, hopefully I can. Uh, make things a little clearer, break them down a little bit. So first, can you tell us a little bit about your journey and what brought you to this work? Absolutely. So um, I actually trained first in traditional medicine. So I went to medical school and then I did a residency in ophthalmology and then I did a fellowship in neuro-ophthalmology. And I was working for an academic institution most of my career. So I was working for a large academic institution as a uh, associate professor, seeing patients, teaching, doing research. Um, but uh, what happened was that during this path, um, I began to have a particular health problem of my own. And, um, and dealing with that health problem really opened up my, my world to other approaches to healing and health and really turned me on to functional medicine. So um, I suffer from migraines. Mm -hmm. And um, I had migraines, you know, mild migraines through my adult life, but then it got to a point where I was going through a very, very stressful period, uh, both at work and at home, and uh, my migraines began to be ha happening every single day, and it was really quite debilitating and no medications were working. I tried pretty much all the medications on the market and nothing was working. And my doctors, my headache doctors would just keep giving me prescription after prescription after prescription. And I you know, wasn't getting better. Plus I was having all these side effects. I felt like I was a zombie walking around with this brain fog all the time. So I decided to take things into my own hands and I started doing research on other ways to treat migraine. And what I discovered was that there is so much work out there that's been done on natural approaches to migraine treatment, uh, particularly certain supplements like magnesium, riboflavin, uh, some botanicals, and lifestyle factors, which none of my doctors had ever asked me about. You know, what was I eating? How much caffeine did I have? How much was I sleeping? So once I started to re realize, oh my goodness, maybe you know, what I'm, my choices are, are making my migraines worse. So once I started to address that, I finally started to get better. And it was really like, it was a life changer for me, like recognizing that my nutrition plays a role in my migraine, my sleep, you know, everything, my stress. And so I use these strategies for myself and then I use them for my patients. And many of my patients who have migraine really benefited. And I was, and I said, wait a minute, this is, this is really so critical. And most traditionally trained doctors don't even ask, they don't recognize these factors. And once I got turned on to that, I actually then became introduced to functional medicine. Mm -hmm. And then I, I just fell in love with the concepts and the philosophy. And I started training in functional medicine. And then ultimately what happened was I quit my job. And I opened up my own practice to be able to provide the care that my patients need to take a deep dive into functional medicine, into the root cause, get you know, really deep into nutrition and lifestyle. And in the, in the traditional kind of medical um, system, you know, which is mainly insurance-based, 
um, where doctors only can spend, you know, 10 to 15 minutes with a patient. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't deliver the care that I really felt like my patients needed and deserved. So that's why I went out on my own and I opened up my own practice. Um, so that's been my journey in a, in a nutshell. So sorry for the long answer, but I thought oh, it was no, important that's... to kind of put it in the framework of, of how I ended up where I am now. Yeah, you've, you've taken, you've taken a lot of stops here and definitely layered on a lot of different um, knowledge uh, to serve your, your patients. Um, can you tell me about Envision Health uh, NYC? And yeah, absolutely. Why, why your approach to treating these eye conditions is unique. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I have actually have a solo private practice based in New York City. And, you know, my goal is, and my mission is really to teach people how to prevent eye disease and common eye disease that many other traditionally trained ophthalmologists probably will say, oh, it's inevitable, you'll eventually get mm -hmm. cataracts or glaucoma or macular degeneration, you'll eventually have these issues and potentially be at risk for vision loss. Well, I, I really believe differently. Mm -hmm. I believe that if we take the right steps early in terms of really our diet and our lifestyle and do things proactively, that we can prevent many of these things from happening later in life. And, you know, many of us, unfortunately, we take our eyesight for granted. It's kind of, you know, an afterthought. <laughs> um, you know, we just expect that we'll be able to see. Well, we expect that we will be able to see our phones and read and watch TV and see faces. But uh, unfortunately, many conditions that happen later in life take away some of those joys of life, you know, not being able to do those basic things. And, and what people don't realize is what we do now will impact our vision decades from now. So, you know, many people are living now longer and longer and longer. And, you know, what we do in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s really will impact our eye health long term. So if you want to live long and have a, a wonderful, fulfilling life and be able to maintain good vision, you really need to start now. And that's what I teach in my practice. And, and I use a lot of nutritional protocols. And I also deal with a lot of um, autoimmune diseases that affect the eyes. So many people may not realize that autoimmune disease is rampant in, in many eye diseases. So for example, lupus can affect the eyes, rheumatoid arthritis, thyroid, um, like Hashimoto's or Graves disease can affect the eyes. And so I use a lot of my nutritional botanical protocols for those types of diseases also. Wow. And, and I thought you mentioned MS too. Yes, yes, that's, yeah. that's a major one as well because MS can have so many manifestations uh, that affect vision, uh, optic neuritis and other types of vision loss, even double vision. So um, wow. much of what I recommend is, is really based again na in natural approaches rather than, yes, people can be put on, you know, uh, for example, for some of these autoimmune diseases, steroids can be used or immunosuppressants, uh, disease modifying agents, biologics. There are some heavy guns that sometimes can be used and sometimes need to be used, but my goal is to try to help people get off some of those medications. Mm -hmm. And I've been, I've been really successful at at least getting them to, helping them to decrease their dose and potentially even get off some of these immunomodulatory immunosuppressant medications. Um, wow. Okay, so let's start with blue light damage, which is really relevant based on our screen usage for adults and children. What is blue light and how does it damage the eyes? Yeah, great question. So I know it's really on a lot of people's minds, especially during the pandemic, because we're spending so much time on screens. Um, so blue light um, is, if you think about the, the rainbow, um, blue light is part of that rainbow. It's on the shorter end of the spectrum for that. So they're, they're short wavelengths and they have high energy. And blue light comes from different sources. The majority of the blue light that we get actually comes from the sun. And it's important, we need that blue light because it helps to regulate our circadian rhythms in our sleep-wake cycle. Um, that blue light actually stimulates, there are certain cells in the retina called melanopsin cells. And then that, uh, then that connects with the pineal gland and regulates you know, when, when we're supposed to be alert and awake and when we're supposed to kind of wind down and get ready for bed. So, um, so our bodies are supposed to be in tune with the cycle of blue light that comes from the sun. So there is a rise in the morning and then there's a gradual decrease as the day goes on, signaling to our bodies that it's ready to get ready for bed. But when we get blue light from other sources, for example, our screens, whether it be our computer, our tablet, our phone, um, even the lights that we use in our homes, you know, there are energy saving lights like CFL lights, compact fluorescence or LED lights. These lights save energy, but they also emit a tremendous amount of blue light, much more than traditional lights did, like for example, incandescence. 
they mm -hmm. don't emit that much blue light. So we're getting blue light from our screens, from the lights in our homes, and this blue light can cause, can have health effects. So um, yes, it can affect our sleep wake cycle. And then in terms of our eyes, um, theoretically, that blue light can potentially damage our retinas. Now that's theoretically, because there has been no clinical study to show that this blue light that we're getting from our devices uh, will actually cause permanent damage or blindness. Um, so long-term wise, there's no long-term risk. And, and truly if blue light really did cause permanent damage, we would be having an epidemic of blindness right now. If you really think about it with the amount of time that we all spend on the screen, it would be an epidemic of blindness. And we're not seeing that, but blue light can cause short-term issues with our eyes. It can lead to something called digital eye strain. And you may have heard of it, or digital eye strain is sometimes also called computer vision syndrome. But basically, you know, spending a lot of time on a screen, there are certain symptoms that people can get. So these include uh, trouble focusing, blurred vision, dry eye, light sensitivity from the blue light, um, sometimes even headaches and neck strain. So that's kind of the umbrella term is digital eye strain and blue light is definitely linked to that. So to combat that, um, there's a couple of ways that we can really um, kind of fortify ourselves to combat that. And what many people don't realize is that we actually have natural blue blockers in our eyes. Uh, yes, many people have probably heard of blue blocking glasses, etc. Um, but we actually, nature actually put blue blocking pigments inside of our eyes, in our retinas. And these pigments um, we can get from foods and we can get them from supplements. And um, the pigments, the names are uh, lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. I don't know if you've ever heard of those, but- We have a lutein. I yeah, so- I heard of it, but- yeah, um, they're common, um, commonly found in many eye health supplements, but these are naturally occurring pigments found in uh, many uh, types of vegetables and fruits. For example, green leafy vegetables like spinach, kale, collard greens are very, very high. These, this class is very, very high in lutein and zeaxanthin. And when you eat these types of foods, um, the body absorbs the pigments, lutein and zeaxanthin, and deposits them in the retina, right where our central vision comes from. So our 2020 vision comes from the macula, and that's where these pigments are deposited. And what the pigments do is they basically absorb certain wavelengths of light and neutralize them. So they're, they're very potent antioxidants, and um, they absorb not only blue light, but also UV light. And so if we can fortify our eyes with these pigments by eating those types of foods, also um, other foods that are rich in these pigments include uh, yellow and orange types of vegetables, like for example, fruits and vegetables, like for example, corn and orange peppers are rich in lutein and zeaxanthin and also egg yolk. So that beautiful orange color of egg yolk actually comes from lutein and zeaxanthin. So, um, so we can get these from food. Sometimes we can get them from a supplement. Unfortunately, many of us are deficient because we just don't eat enough of those foods um, that are rich in these pigments. And for example, lutein, uh, the recommended amount is 6.5 milligrams a day. And most people on a Western diet will probably only get one or two milligrams a day. So unfortunately, many of us are deficient. And in, for many people, I do recommend that they take an eye health supplement with that lutein zeaxanthin. And if you can't remember the names, that's okay. Um, a quick tip is um, there's an ingredient called Ludamax 2020 that is found in many eye health supplements across the, uh, the board. So look for Ludamax 2020 on the label, and then you know that you're getting the right amount of pigment for your eyes, because they come in, you know, the pigment can be found in different strengths depending on the supplement that you're getting. But look for that Ludamax 2020, and that will provide you with what you need. Hmm. Okay, so who is the most at risk for blue light damage? Everyone, or is there a specific? Great question. So there is some research that suggests that children are more at risk. And that is because their eyes don't naturally filter out as many of those almost those um, high energy rays as adult eyes do because their eyes are still developing. Mm -hmm. So again, potentially children are more at risk. And this is based off of some um, early studies, uh, really uh, not clinical, so not, in, not in humans, but, but other types of studies that suggest that children's eyes just don't filter out light as well. So again, you can make sure your kids are getting those nutrients in their diet. Um, 
perhaps give them a supplement. There are great gummy supplements for kids, like eye health gummy supplements that are on the market. Again, there's a couple of different brands that make them. And then in terms of blue blocking glasses, I know a lot of parents ask, me this like or for themselves they asked me like do I need to wear blue blockers should my children be wearing blue blockers let me just break that down a little bit um, the light that comes from our screens is typically on the longer end wavelength of blue light so blue light is between 400 to 500 nanometers and the light that comes from our screens is usually like six sorry, uh, 460 to 475. So a little bit on the long end. So hopefully it's not the shorter rays that really cause the damage. But, um, but for example, blue blocking glasses, I have some here. Mm -hmm. uh, they have different, they, different tints. Like for example, this is a yellow tint. Some are clear yeah. and some are deeper. Like for example, I have this one here, which is a really deep red. And um, in order to block out the blue light that comes from our screens, um, what I would suggest is getting a tint that's a little bit darker. And the reason is because like, for example, when I put this on here, um, I definitely see the blue looks different on my screen, but I can definitely see the color blue, which means that these are not blocking out all of that blue light. They're blocking out, these are probably about 30% blue blocking. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're gonna get blue blocking glasses for that reason, to protect your eyes, to help relieve digital eye strain, um, I would recommend getting the deeper red because when I put these on and I look at my screen, I don't see any blue whatsoever. So I know that these glasses are probably, these are probably like 98 to 100% blue blocking. So choose glasses that have a deeper tint or ask your optician or ask the manufacturer, what percentage blue light does it really block out? That's an important question to ask because not all blue blockers are made the same. Um, now there was a study that was just published last month looking at whether blue blocking glasses are really effective. So what the study did was they took volunteers like healthy people, 24 healthy adults, and they had them use a screen for about two hours and use blue blockers. And they were actually using the lighter, the lighter filter. Yeah. So about 30% blue blocking. And it found that study found that these glasses really didn't make a big difference. But if you think about it practically, I and mean, most of us are on screens much more than two hours a day. So perhaps, you know, those people that, that did the study, they weren't really getting the, you know, they weren't really experiencing full digital eye strain. Plus the blue blockers that they used weren't really filtering out most of the blue light. So uh, perhaps more studies need to be done looking at different filters, like different percentage filters of blue blocking glasses and um, seeing if they really make a difference or not. But I can tell you just from my personal experience and from my patients experience that people do feel more comfortable when they wear blue blockers. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And especially at nighttime, like right before, you know, if you have to be on your screen and I know I am, I'm guilty of this. You know, I work late into the night and I'm on my screen well after the sun is set. So find what works best for you, but maybe try out different tints and see what works best for you. Yeah, it definitely feels a little different at first too. Like my eyes had to adjust um, and to even changing the settings on my computer. Um, does that, so I guess that also maybe is just like a small percentage of blocking blue light. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah. So the there are different modes you can put your computer on uh, and all even your phone, like there's night shift mode yeah. and yeah. then um, drawer Androids have a different mode that they use. And that, um, those modes basically based on the time where you are in your geographic location, based on the, the setting of the sun, um, it will adjust the amount of blue light coming from your screen. So that can be quite effective. Um, the, other, the other thing I like is there, there are a couple of apps that you can download to your uh, phone or to your computer, your tablet that, nat that internally filter out the blue light. And these apps are called Flux. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this before, no. but it's, it's called Flux, F dot L-U-X is one of them. And then the other one is called Iris. And um, I can, I can uh, send you the link so you can share them with your, your listeners. But um, I actually prefer Iris because Iris has um, different functionality. It actually has 27 different settings you can use. And you can play around with the settings and feel what and see what you feel most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. But for example, there's healthy mode, there's sleep mode, there's night mode, there's um, movie mode. Um, so there are so many different modes that you can use on Iris. And the other thing that Iris does, which the, the other app Flux doesn't do, is that um, our screens all have a flicker rate. 
And many people don't realize that their screen is actually going on, off, on, off, on, off. And the reason why our screens were designed this way is to save battery, to save energy. So, you know, it's not on at full brightness all the time. So our screens are constantly flickering. Our eyes can't really perceive it because it's so fast, this flicker rate, but our brains can perceive it. And our brains can, especially if people are prone to light sensitivity or migraines, digital eye strain, our brains can really get irritated by this constant flickering of the screen. So the Iris app actually takes out the flicker. So it actually removes internally from your screen, it takes out the flicker. So it really makes a huge difference. Per, per, I mean, particularly if you're if you suffer from migraines and light sensitivity like I do, it's a tremendous you know, um, uh, help. And you, you'll notice the difference right away if you use Iris. So, wow. so, but again, you can try either one and see what works best. Um, both of them, I think, are initially, you can just try them for free. There's a free trial. And then there's a nominal fee, just like a user fee, uh, lifetime fee. So it's, I think it's a, a great investment. So um, how can we combat potential damage, especially in kids? So are, do you recommend for kids that they wear these blue light blockers all day or just during, you know, the afternoon to evening? Um, yeah, I, I don't think that they need to wear them all day because again, blue light is healthy. Uh, when it's when we get it at certain times of the day, it's really later on in the day, particularly after uh, the sun is set, that we really have to be a little bit more uh, just mindful of our screen time. And uh, I'm really glad you brought up the topic of kids in particular with blue light. Um, there's some early research that suggests that too much blue light exposure in kids, particularly later into the day, can be associated with some behavioral issues, for example, ADHD. Um, that uh, has been linked to blue light exposure later on in the day or computer or screen time later on in the day. Mm -hmm. So we still don't fully know that connection, whether you know too much blue light exposure really will lead to ADHD or we can potentially exacerbate ADHD. Mm -hmm. But it's something that you know as parents, we all need to just be cognizant, cognizant of and be mindful of. So perhaps later on in the day, if your kids are you know on a screen, whether it's watching Netflix or you know playing a game or you know, doing homework, uh, perhaps at that time is it is really important to get them some blue blockers, but also make sure your kids are getting their nutrients that they need to stay healthy, their eyes to stay healthy, and and maybe even use that screen filter I was talking about, the screen filter app. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so the best foods, you already talked about this. It's leafy green. You said a lot of leafy green vegetables. Um, yes. An orange color. You didn't mention carrots, which is funny because that's the only one that I think is always so common in my mind. Like, oh, carrots are good for your eyes. Yeah, it's are a myth they, that that it's a myth. <laughs> Actually, I shouldn't say it's a myth. <laughs> Excuse me. It's a partial myth because a, a lot of us, and my parents included, told me eat your carrots for good eyesight to keep your yeah. eyes healthy. So, carrots have um, uh, have beta carotene, which is a form of vitamin A. And we need vitamin A for our retinas to stay healthy because if we don't get vitamin A, uh, there's a risk for night blindness and there's a risk for dry eye. So yes, beta carotene is important that come in. It comes from carrots, but it also comes from other orange types of fruits and vegetables like pumpkin and squash and et cetera. But um, so in terms of what nutrients our eyes need to stay healthy, we don't just need beta carotene. We need a full spectrum of antioxidants, okay. vitamins, minerals, omegas, particularly omega-3s like DHA is really, really important. Um, and then uh, antioxidants like glutathione, and you may have heard of that there's some other antioxidants like alpha lipoic acid, uh, N-acetylcysteine. And so um, I've done a lot of research in terms of this, you know, in terms of what our eyes need, and we need probably over 20 nutrients. So beyond that beta carotene, beyond this carrot. So how oh, yeah. are you going to get all of those 20 nutrients? I mean, do you have to keep a log? And my answer is no, you don't have to really keep a log. But there are certain uh, just very practical things you can do in terms of your diet to make sure you're getting that full spectrum of all the 20 plus nutrients your eyes need to stay healthy. And the best way to do that is to have a plant rich diet not plant-based. I'm not saying you have to be vegan or vegetarian, plant rich. And what that means is you want to have all, all the different colors 
of plants in your diet. You wanna have your greens, different shades of greens. You wanna also get your oranges, yellows, reds. You also wanna get the darker colors. You wanna get blues and purples and even blacks in your diet. And the best way to get that is through plants from vegetables and fruits. And what I tell my patients is, Try to cycle through all of these different colors in your diet during the week. So eat the rainbow, mm-hmm. not Skittles, not M&Ms, but the rainbow of plants. And um, you know, a simple tip is most of us eat three meals a day, seven days a week. So that's about 21 meals a week. So have a different color with each meal. Yeah. And if you do that, you'll get 21 different colors during the week. And then you don't really have to think about it because you're already getting all of those nutrients your eyes need. And then of course you want to also make sure you're getting some omega. So whether, you know, whether that's some form of um, fish, you know, salmon is a great source of omega-3, um, even, you know, trout, sardines, um, anchovies, uh, great sources of healthy fats. Or if you're vegan or vegetarian, then you can turn to some of the seeds like Um, chia seeds, hemp seeds, uh, flax seeds, these are great sources of omega-3s. So make sure you're getting all of those nutrients through a a varied diet. And I also usually tell my patients, try to strive for three to five cups of veggies and fruits a day. And that may seem like a lot to many people, you know, like, oh my goodness, how can I get like five cups of veggies in in a day? Like, I just can't eat that many. But sorry? For an adult? for an adult, even children, if they can have three cups a day, that's, that's great. Um, But a simple thing to do is just have a smoothie, you know, Mm -hmm. and if you have a a green smoothie in particular, get those leafy greens in there, like a spinach or kale smoothie and add, you know, maybe a banana or an apple, and then some of your your seeds, like hemp seeds, chia seeds, you're going to get at least three cups in that smoothie. And then maybe have, you know, a fruit later in the day in the salad also. So then you got your five cups right there. So it's really not that difficult to try to get five cups of colorful uh, plants in your diet every single day. Hmm. Okay, so I like how you said that we can eat it all throughout the week Um, because sometimes I hear that when you say all, you're listing all these different foods and I'm like thinking that's a lot to eat. And to try and think about how can we do that without a supplement, but it's enough to have something, you know, once, once a week, you know, yes. like eat peppers yeah. once a week. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So if you, if you eat, you know, one particular veggie or fruit once a week, but you're eating other things the rest of the yeah. week. So you're, you're going to get that spectrum in your diet. Just keep it varied. And yes, carrots are great, but that's not the only thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so macular degeneration, I hope I said that right, is a leading cause of blindness. Um, What is that um, and how do you treat it? Uh, wow, that's a that's a loaded question. So I will try to answer. (laughs) Um, So I I have um, a particular passion for macular degeneration and treatment of macular degeneration. And it's because I myself am at risk. I did um, did a genetic test. I did 23andMe and it said I have a risk or gene for macular degeneration. And it really, you know, really scared me because as an yeah. ophthalmologist, you know, this is what I do. I help people preserve, preserve their eyesight and to think that I myself am at risk for something. Yeah. Um, it really scared me. So I really did a lot of research and I ended up, what ended up happening was I compiled all this research I did for my, myself and for my patients and I put it into a book. And so my book is going to be coming out hopefully in the summer of 2021. Um, there have been a couple of delays along the way due to the pandemic, but hopefully in a couple of months it'll be out. But um, but in terms, so let me explain what macular degeneration is first. So um, the retina is in the back of the eye and it's basically like um, the film of a camera. So if you think back to like the old style cameras that very few of us use anymore, but um, light comes in from the front of the camera and then it gets um, kind of absorbed by the film and that's what gives us the image. So the retina is like the film of the camera and we need the retina absolutely to have good vision, but the center part of the retina is the macula. And if you think about the retina like a bullseye Uh, with different kind of circles. And and as you get closer to the center, that's when your vision, the highest resolution vision comes from the center and that's the macula. So um, what happens in macular degeneration is that the center part develops these uh, deposits underneath the retina. And these deposits are waste products. The waste products don't get cleared properly. And then eventually as the waste products keep developing, then there's a risk to vision, our central vision. So people with macular degeneration in the advanced stages lose their central vision. So imagine like if you're looking at someone's face and there's a big gray spot 
right where their facial features would be. That's what somebody with macular degeneration, unfortunately, um, sees or can't see is that central area. And it's very, very debilitating because with macular degeneration, people can't read because we need our central vision to read. They can't drive. Many people can't work. Um, they can't watch television, they can't see faces. So it steals not only vision, but it also steals many of the joys of life. And the good news is that we can prevent macular degeneration. There are ways to prevent vision loss, mainly through diet and lifestyle choices. And that's what I really address in my book is, you know, what can we do to prevent this uh, leading cause of blindness? Um, there are other risk factors other than genetics. So other risk factors include age. So the older someone is, the more the, the risk is. So for example, if someone's in their 50s, their risk is only about 2%. But if they're in their 70s, the risk jumps up to like 30%. And it goes higher and higher the older people get. So, um, so again, we need to do things now when we're younger uh, to protect ourselves for later on in life so we can still maintain good vision. Yeah. Um, other risk factors, sex. So for example, women are much more at risk for macular degeneration than men. And we don't quite understand why that is. I mean, some people propose, oh, it's because women live longer. So they have longer lifespans and that's why they were at higher risk, but that's not the only reason. There must be some hormonal component there. Um, perhaps estrogen, progesterone, even testosterone levels play a role, but we don't quite understand that. And the other major risk factor for macular degeneration is uh, and this is really um, interesting for many people is, is their pigmentation. So for example, people who have lighter eyes, lighter skin and lighter hair tend to be at higher risk. And it's thought that it's because um, pigment in the back of the eye can help be protective against macular degeneration and people who have lighter pigmentation has, have less melanin or less pigment in their retina or underneath their retina. So they're potentially at higher risk, hmm. but it is preventable. So, um, there are many strategies people can use to prevent macular degeneration. A lot of it has to go back to nutrition, what we're eating, um, certain antioxidants that are very protective, certain spices that are protective. Um, so I go through that in my book. Um, so again, sorry for the long answer, but uh, this is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, yeah. Um, so is this something that happens usually um, later in life? Or is this something you know parents should be looking out for in their children now? Uh, so macular degeneration does does not happen in younger people. Um, there's a different form of it called Stargardt's disease, but that's a different condition. Uh, it, it's actually a genetic condition. But macular degeneration tends to happen in older individuals, usually above the age of 65, mm -hmm. and. Um, because the eye is actually, it's, a, it's part of our, ner our nervous system, it's actually an extension of the brain, macular degeneration is actually the leading neurodegenerative condition in the world. So it's actually more common than Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease combined, which a lot of people don't realize. No, I didn't so know. yeah, so, um, so again, it's neurodegenerative and there are ways to prevent it by, again, doing these things that we uh, many of us don't really think about, you know, what are we eating? You want to eat certain foods, but you also want to stay away from certain foods. And this is something I cover in a chapter in my book. You want to stay away from foods that are pro-inflammatory. And many of us, and many people, unfortunately, who live in the Western world are on a Western style diet that I call the sad diet. Many people call this a sad diet, the standard American diet. Yeah. And it tends to include foods that are rich in, um, uh, omega-6 fatty acids that are pro-inflammatory, rich in refined carbohydrates and rich in processed chemicals. And, and so studies have actually shown that people who have the SAD diet are at higher risk for macular degeneration. So, so you know, trying to shift our diet away from those, you know, yeah. those types of foods is really important. And that starts early. So of course it starts in childhood. We want to teach our kids right. But fortunately, kids don't get affected by this. It really is uh, older adults that tend to get affected by this. Mm. Okay, but we want to always start um, with our health young and now. That's, I guess, the, the idea behind functional, one of the principles behind functional medicine, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Teach, teach our kids early, stay away from inflammation, inflammatory foods. And the other two root causes of macular degeneration are, uh, so inflammation is one of them, but there are also um, oxidative stress and also mitochondrial dysfunction. So a lot of the nutrients that we have in our diet, mainly that come from plants, will help fight against those three root causes of macular degeneration. 
Okay, so I have kind of probably a loaded question here, but um, cortical vision impairment. <laughs> it wasn't even on my list of questions and I didn't see anything about it on your site or anything, but I understand that, that that is actually not an issue with the eye, that is with the brain. Yes. Um, my son yeah. had that. Um, oh my goodness. And, and a lot of our um, audience probably listeners, maybe their kids have that as well. Um, so does any of this apply to, <laughs> to helping care for maybe someone who has cortical vision impairment? Because well, when you were um, talking about, I'm sorry, when you're talking about the um, macular degeneration, you said that they can't see face, people can't see faces. And that is another condition, and I wish I remembered the name, maybe it's just cortical vision impairment, but I have someone else that I interviewed, a mom and her son can't see faces <clears throat> in particular, but it's cortical vision impairment, but it sounded just like what you're talking about. Yeah, so, um, so if you don't mind, I, I just wanna hear a little bit about your son's story, like how did he develop this or, or kind of what's, what's happened with his cortical vision impairment? Um, well, he had a traumatic brain injury mm -hmm. um, okay. when he was from a virus. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'll just uh, explain first that um, we actually don't see with our eyes. We see with our brains okay. and um, the eyes are the conduit to the brain. So the retina, as I was saying, it captures the light images and then sends those images through the optic nerve to the visual cortex, which is in the back of the brain. And then there are many visual accessory pathways. So the occipital cortex is what's responsible for most of our vision, but then the parietal lobe is also involved in vision processing and the temporal lobe. So it's a very complex network. And um, also it's important to recognize that 30% of our brains are dedicated to our visual pathways, which wow. is really mind boggling to think that 30% of our brain is dedicated to our vision. Wow. So, um, so when you talk about cortical vision impairment, there are potentially different um, anatomic places or, or uh, networks that are involved in that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the most severe scenario of that is something called cortical blindness. And in that situation, uh, in most cases, it could be from a traumatic brain injury, it could be from a virus, it could be from a medication or even extremely high blood pressure, but parts of the back of the brain on both sides don't get enough oxygen and they basically completely dysfunction. And in those situations, people are, are truly completely blind. So that's kind of the, the most extreme right. um, form of that. Uh, and unfortunately, um, in younger individuals, particularly if they've suffered from something like traumatic brain injury, or this is due to a virus, it's a temporary issue. And there is um, opportunity for that to improve. There is neuroplasticity where people can actually improve and regain a lot of their vision. Now, if the cortical blindness comes from something else, like for example, a stroke, um, I have seen many patients, unfortunately, who have had a stroke that's affected their, both of their occipital cortices and they're completely blind. If it's from a stroke, unfortunately, the prognosis isn't that great and many people don't recover very well or at all. But in the younger population, there is a chance for improvement. And because the visual processing centers are so complex, um, there can be different manifestations of that. So for example, not being able to see faces or recognize faces, that is that could be part of the syndrome or not being able to identify colors, that mm -hmm. could be part of the syndrome. Mm -hmm. Or um, perhaps uh, in some cases, people even have uh, visual hallucinations. Um, uh, for example, they see things that aren't there. That could be part of it as well because their brain is expecting to get certain input. And if that, those parts of the brain are not working properly, the brain starts to, starts to discharge and then people can see hallucinations. Um, other people may have issues with reading or writing. For example, um, there's a particular condition where people can um, write, they can write, for example, they can write their name, but they, they won't, won't be able to read what they just wrote. So these are all, again, issues with the networks in the different parts of the brain, the visual processing parts of the brain. But what I would suggest for people, especially again, if it's due to traumatic brain injury or virus or um, some other metabolic issue is to do therapy. Um, there are many different types of vision therapy that can be done. So find um, a center that does 
some kind of vision rehabilitation therapy mm -hmm. and really, um, really, uh, you know, keep at it because I know it can be quite frustrating for many people. They may not see improvement right away, but it's really persistence um, and trying to teach your brain new pathways and new ways to function is really, really important in those, in those types of situations. So I, I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah, uh, um, that would kind of be the overview to it. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, what about, do all the same nutrients apply? I mean, those are all great things anyway. They sound like they're good probably for many things other than just your eyes, but would you say that those are also important for someone whose child has cortical vision impairment to help infuse into their child's diet? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, these are very, um, these nutrients are uh, antioxidant, but they're also bioflavonoids and they include bio bioflavonoids or pigments that come from plants that protect the plants. Mm -hmm. And so they're great for brain health. Um, and then also to help stabilize blood vessels to help improve blood flow. So I think many of the nutrients that I recommend for eye health are also important for brain health. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And the omegas too. I mean, don't forget the omegas. The, you know, the brain has a very high, rich uh, concentration of DHA, as does the retina. Uh, both the brain and the retina have very, very high concentrations, probably the most in the entire body. So make sure you're getting a, a good source of DHA um, if you have, uh, or if you or someone you know is suffering from cortical vision impairment. Does DHA specifically, um, so I, give my kids cod liver oil, <laughs> um, fermented cod liver oil. Um, but DHA is like a different supplement. And is that, can that be found? Is that found in fish as well? I don't know anything about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, no, so it's, it's found in fish, um, high concentrations again in salmon yeah. and okay. trout. Oh. And, and, um, uh, and then um, in terms of other sources, um, again, the seeds are, are, it's not DHA in particular, but it's ALA that comes from um, the chia seeds, flax seeds, right. hemp seeds, and then that ALA gets converted into DHA. So okay. those, that's another way to get it. But if you want the direct, you can you know, definitely have fish and, um, and hopefully low mercury fish. So wild caught is best. Um, and then um, perhaps take a supplement as well. There are many different supplements um, some are liquid for children that may be best and some are capsules. Um, mm -hmm. And I love the fact that you said you, you do a fermented um, cod liver oil because, uh, you know, uh, helping our, our gut microbiome is also important for brain health. A lot of people don't recognize that there's a gut brain connection and uh, we need to keep our gut microbiome healthy to have um, good overall health, brain health, eye health, even then there's, there's also a gut eye connection. So, uh, so our guts are really important to keep healthy and, and um, yeah. uh, eating fermented foods is a great way to do that or perhaps taking a probiotic, but I am always in favor of taking live probiotics through foods rather than a supplement. Right, okay. Um, that's all good to know. Okay, so but dry eye, this is one more last thing I wanted to touch on. That's a common problem. Um, does nutrition, I assume that <laughs> nutrition also affects that. It um, does, it does. So we're gonna go back to those omega-3s. So, um, so we have little glands in our eyelids. Uh -huh. And you know, if you pull down your lid, you can probably see like little little dots on the in the inner part. That those are the openings of the glands. And those glands are called meibomian glands. And they secrete oil. And that oil helps to lubricate the surface of the eye. We have tears, but then the oily layer basically prevents those tears from evaporating. So we need to have healthy oils on the surface of the eye to protect against dry eye. And one of the best ways to do that is, is through having omega-3s in your diet. There are many studies that have shown that people who have a high dietary intake of omega-3s have less dry eye, particularly women. And there's definitely a difference between women and men when it comes to dry eye. Um, particularly women who are perimenopausal, postmenopausal, much higher incidence of dry eye. So have your omega-3s and also vitamin A is also important for dry eye. And if, if you have dry eye and things are just not getting better, um, I would also suggest talking to your eye doctor about getting those glands imaged. So um, in my office, for example, I have um, a, a, a camera that actually uses um, 
it takes an infrared picture of the of the glands and I can see what the structure is of the glands and oh. I can see if the glands are intact I can see if the glands are clogged and then um, you know if they're structurally okay but they're not working properly there are treatments for that uh, there is something called lipiflow that I use in my office to help to basically clear out the glands and reset the glands. So there are many different treatments for dry eye. Of course, you can use artificial tears, um, over-the-counter artificial tears. Um, I would recommend getting something maybe with some omega-3 in it. So now they have a couple of brands have come out with artificial tears with omega-3s in them. Like for example, um, Refresh Reliva, which is over-the-counter sustained balance and retain, they all have some omega-3 in them, mm -hmm. uh, which is, is which is great. And then um, you can also do some hot compresses and the compresses basically help to keep the oil, oil glands healthy. They help to, if their glands are clogged, um, it, the heat from the compresses helps to kind of loosen up any blockage in the glands. And then hopefully they can start to function a little bit better again. So there are many things you can do for dry eye, but um, if you're really talking about getting to the root cause of dry eye, the majority of people with dry eye have hormonal issues or they have issues with their glands and it's important to address that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so what what's your takeaway message for our listeners about their eye health um, after all that? Yeah, takeaway message is don't just take your eyesight for granted. Many of us do, but it really is important to do things, make healthy choices in our diet. Like we, we talked about eating that rainbow of colors um, during the week and getting your omegas and also healthy lifestyle choices. So uh, we didn't talk about this much, but UV light is also potentially damaging to the eyes. So you wanna always wear UVA, UVB blocking sunglasses when you're outside. Even on cloudy days, I wear my sunglasses. Um, so think about things like that. Exercise is also important for eye health. It helps to keep our uh, keep a healthy body weight and also promote blood flow to the eyes. So we want to exercise, have a good diet, protect our eyes from different wavelengths of light. Just kind of really be mindful of your eye health and start early. Teach your kids also start early. Don't just take your vision for granted. Yeah. Well, well, I didn't know that your thirty percent of your brain um, affects your vision, or is it? would you say controls your vision? Yes, is responsible for responsible. our vision, uh, for processing our vision and uh, yeah. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share with the Brain Possible community to be complete? Um, absolutely, so um, I, I have a lot of uh, resources. So, you know, we talked a lot about a lot of different, lot of different topics during today today's um, podcast, but I have a lot of resources on my website, so you can visit my website if you wanted to find out more. Um, in terms of macular degeneration, if you or someone you know has it or may be at risk for it, um, my book is coming up, but I also offer a macular degeneration masterclass, mm -hmm. and this is a free webinar. So if you're interested in that, please sign up for my webinar. Um, I will, I'll send you the link. Um, if, if, you, uh, if you'd like to share it with your listeners. And also I'm very active on social media. So if you wanted to find out more about eye health tips and brain health tips, um, you can follow me on Instagram um, at dr.ronniebanick. I'm also on Facebook. I have two Facebook groups. I have um, one group is called Envision Health where I talk a lot about eye health, um, natural ways to protect our eyes. And then I also have a second group called Eye on Migraine where I talk a lot about um, migraine tips, like natural ways yeah. to prevent migraines. So uh, lots of resources out there. So please um, check them out or reach out to me if you wanted to find out more. Perfect. Yeah, it sounds like you're a fantastic resource. Um, I definitely hear about migraines a lot and I think they're coming, becoming, I, I wanna say that I feel like they're becoming more common. <laughs> they are. Um, it's estimated that 10% of the population suffers from migraines. Brain. So it's a huge percentage of the population. Uh, and many people don't even know that they have migraine. People, people have headaches and they don't, they've never been formally diagnosed. So um, it is important to, to bring it up with your doctor because a lot of people think, oh, I need to talk about this, this, and this with my doctor, but they don't really talk about their headaches. So definitely seek, seek out some help and, and consider some natural therapies as well because they're really effective, um, really, really effective. Sounds like it. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I know that your time is valuable and I appreciate you spending it with me here this morning. This Thank afternoon. you so much. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. And I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. 
I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and that you learned something new. Do you have a question for Dr. Bannock? Is there a particular eye condition that you'd like us to cover more in depth? We would love to hear from you. Email us at info at thebrainpossible.com. Be sure to subscribe, follow, and share our podcast if that feels true for you. You may also consider visiting our website for more information on stories, therapies, and products that we think that you will love. As always, thank you for spending your precious time with us at The Brain Possible.